back to the Curious Q with your host Isabella, Luke, and your favorite turtle Holden. Yay! Uh, welcome <laughs> back for episode six, and it's just us three this time. Uh, so after two great, fantastic interviews, we're back with the OG trio. Uh, so how have you guys been recently? What have I done Pretty recently? Good. I'm done with all my PSA. So I only have Woo, final exams. Oh my gosh. When I finished on Thursday night, and I, I, well, aside from like a little correction I had to make on Friday night, and oh my gosh, the, I'm, I am feel so free. <laughs> also, oh my god, get me out of here. <laughs> you have three more years, Isabella. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. I'll, I'll, I, I feel like I'll be like, I, I'm like willing to do three more years of this. But like, oh, my God, I'm so done with this school year. Please <laughs> save me. I don't know. I feel like I've been drowning in work for so long and I've been like really burnt. So, yeah. How, how about you guys? On the non-academic side, we also like me and some people like went outside on the field and like played various like sports outside it was a good time the weather was really nice did you touch the grass is that why your forehead's like a little red uh probably did mance not put on sunscreen (laughs) maybe smh starting to feel my arms are also starting to feel a little bit odd Perhaps I did get sunburned. <laughs> wow. I figuratively burnt out, but I might be literally burnt. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like fun, though. Uh, our uh, our wing did like a hot pot lunch, which was really nice. And Holden, how have you been? It's been good. I need to catch up on all my music projects now mm. that I have no more P-sets. Yeah, but I have finals and then dance. Dance is taking up so much time. <laughs> oh, whatever. It's fine. We will get through it, and then we will be free. What are you guys doing over the summer? Ooh, what <laughs> are we doing in what all are of we June? Doing? I wonder. Maybe we'll all Ooh. be in the same location. Who could have thunk? At that least for crazy. three weeks. Yeah. So yeah, we will all be together at Bop this summer. So I will be an RA, and these two will be. Uh, you your, want to explain like what all the acronyms are? I'm a residential assistant. I make sure we start with the exact same number of students that we end with. No more, no less. Do they have to be the same students, or does just the number have to be the same? Preferably the same students. <laughs> As for you two. We will be I will... TAs or colloquially yes, referred to as teaching trainers. assistants. Mm-hmm. I, I, for one, am glad I won't have to be doing any grading. I had enough of that. Am I allowed to say this? Yeah. Uh, like, I, I guess since it's like all over and all the scores are out, I was a USMO grader this year and I was very, I, I think that's enough grading for like the rest of the year. Thanks, guys. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah and uh, like all that talk about like contests and like problem writing and stuff like that leads us to the topic of today's episode which is problem writing uh so we've got quite a lot to say about the subject uh and yeah very looking forward to it so uh so, yeah. mm-hmm. i guess i, I think can holden get probably has the most experience out of the three of us do i really yeah, yeah probably at least in olympia uh, for Ordinary. olympiads definitely yeah yeah so you, you can, can go first. I can start. Okay, so I've been writing since I was a, cont- a contestant, actually, um, because I always thought it was cool to, like, construct my own problems and then share them. Um, so I, like, how do I how do I describe this? I guess the way I come up with problems is I just, like, like, every time when I have a bit of free time to think, like, you can just think of some weird like contrived construction and then maybe it will turn into an idea so most of my ideas are just really bad but uh eventually if you think enough by random chance some of them will be good and you can submit them to contests um so my problems have appeared on things like usamo and i forgot (laughs) yeah yeah i mean from what i've seen of your ideas you have a lot of good ideas so if most of your ideas are bad you must have a lot of bad ideas that's correct (laughs) like think about it if you come up with like one idea every day then and only like 
ten percent of 15. them are good. You've written thirty six <laughs> good problems in a year. That's like really That's good. That's correct. <laughs> so yeah, that is like a first big lesson about problem writing, which is like, or I mean, I think this to some extent can apply to creative endeavors more generally. But like, especially for problem writing, if you write lots, of it, like, if you write one problem, it might be good or it might be bad. But if you write like a bunch of problems, even if most of them are bad, you've still got the good ones. Because all that matters is the good ones. The only ones that need to go on a contest are the good ones. And then you can just put the bad ones just like down in the basement where no one has to look at them. Yeah. So uh, just yeah. Write lots of them and some of them will be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, like Luke said, this is kind of a thing with creative endeavors in general, since I do a bit of creative writing. Uh, like I can tell you that I have written thousands upon thousands upon thousands of terrible writing uh and now i'm at a place where i am reasonably confident in my skills but like uh, i'm talking about like writing writing rather than problem writing though i will talk about problem writing in a moment but uh in terms of writing writing like i had to get a lot of really bad and like really uh really for lack of a better word really cringy writing to get to like stuff that i was like genuinely proud of but like the only thing that really matters is the really good stuff so yeah but actually but yeah in terms of problem writing so i guess we should talk about what makes up a good problem uh i, I so, think for me okay, one factor what's that... a bad problem <laughs> actually no, no hold on sorry well let's oh, yeah, let's okay. go with what's a good problem okay sure um so for me um like maybe I value I overvalue this quality too much compared to other problem writers, but one value I really um, like value is a short problem statement and an aesthetic one. I value this a lot, but you value this even more than I do. I think you might value this more than anyone else I know. <laughs> yes, I do not but know yes, anyone think... who like likes short and concise statements as much as I do, which is why sometimes I'm a bit disappointed when things like. USAMO problem three has a really long statement, which like is understandable because you want to make sure there are no ambiguities to the contestants, but it makes it a tiny bit less aesthetically pleasing when you read it. The aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is important, but you want to write a problem where like when someone looks at it, they're like, oh, that seems kind of interesting. I want to think about it. You want, you want people to like immediately want to think about it. So like, you know, for example, with geometry, I think point problems with fewer points are maybe more interesting than problems that have like 15 points or however many huge numbers and you have some like big complicated diagram or whatever problems with like some interesting surprising relationship even if you only have a few things or like just a short statement that's like somehow shorter and cleaner you want a clean statement you don't want it another thing is relatedly you don't want it to look contrived you don't I mean, it's tolerable sometimes, but like, all of this is like a balancing act. Sometimes you can allow ugly statements or to some extent, or contrived things to some extent. It's a balancing act, but like, you, you don't want, like, you don't want, you, you want the problem to look nice. You want it to be inviting and you want people to want to think about it. Yeah. Quality is somewhat subjective, of course, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, it have you ever read like a really long problem statement and thought like i <laughs> I, I don't want to do this like people are more likely yeah. to gravitate towards like shorter problem statements and longer problem statements because it's a lot easier to read and whatnot uh what about the actual like content of the problem thoughts oh uh, i mean one thing is that <clears throat> you at least for contests I feel like, at least in my experience, I've done more problem writing for contests with numerical answers compared to like Olympiad style things. Like I've I never written an Olympiad problem in my life. <laughs> I'm mean, sorry, uh, keep going. But yeah, like I've one as one of the poems are for HMT, I wrote um, like a bunch of problems for that, which had numerical answers mostly, except the stuff on the team round. And before that, when I was in high school, I also wrote for the online math open contest which unfortunately doesn't really exist anymore but it was good back in the day and that also had numerical answers even though some of the problems were like really hard like olympiad level hard we still like had a you know numerical answers and so like i think one common thread through all that is like there's probably going to be some like idea part of the problem 
and then some like once someone finds the like idea that you want them to find, they're probably going to have to do some amount of like computation to get the answer. You might, this is sometimes called answer extraction. And so <clears throat> you want to make the numbers, like the problem is probably going to have some numerical values and maybe you could fiddle with those. You could change those around. You want to make the numbers nice so that when they're doing the answer extraction, you the contestants are like not sad. You don't want the contestants to be like, okay, I found this great idea, and now I have to multiply 349 <laughs> times 681? What is going on here? You know, you want to you wanna make the numbers, you know, you, you want to make the contestants' lives easier, because like, you want, what's the part, like, if you want solving the problem to be a good experience, Having creative mathematical ideas is the part is like why people are doing these contests. They're not doing it for arithmetic practice. They it's a lot easier to get arithmetic. You can just do that if you want. Uh, so if you want to have the nice ideas, you just you try to make the numbers nice. Um, of course, it's a balancing act. You don't want to make the numbers too nice, or maybe someone could like guess the idea from the numbers or like just guess the answer you know if the answer if you have some problem that's supposed to be really hard but then the answer is two you might want to make it a little bit less guessable i guess two for <laughs> one of the last questions at math price for girls and that's how i got honorable mention one year so congrats because like they they didn't even mention they didn't have anything and i was like oh the answer is supposed to be an integer so i was like okay <laughs> i say two i, I I, I didn't even know that story was correct, but considering I just can't put that number on the spot, I think that <laughs> proves my point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, so what was your experience like as a as like a problem czar? And I ask you this both as like part of the podcast and also because I am a problem czar next year. So Do you want I to haven't even got explain what problem czar is? Right, yeah. So you, for HMT, Harvard MIT math tournament, uh oh look. Luke's wearing the shirt. Uh, Officially, it doesn't stand for anything, but it is mm -hmm. a math tournament that is run by Harvard and MIT students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we to in order to write the problems, we have a small army of problem staff, but then you also have a couple of people at the head, aka the problem czars. And what these people do is uh, they like take the problems, uh, they and they create the test tournament, which is a lot harder than a thing than it sounds. Uh, actually if you'd like to elaborate yeah. a bit more on that, because I have no um, direct experience. So yeah, like, basically, we look at the, like, you know, there's looking at the problems and like, to some extent, getting feedback on which ones are good, just from ours, or possibly, you know, ha also having the problem staff give feedback, and then sort of assemble, you know, some initial drafts of the test or whatever. But like, there's there's a lot of like having to have opinions on the test and also to some extent writing more problems to fill gaps uh and i guess this sort of like segues like I, I this is not technically on the topic of problem writing since this, this is sort of writing on the level of an entire contest rather than mm -hmm. just on the level of a single problem but i think this is like closely related enough and so you know part of filling in gaps is like you want to have balance in terms of difficulty and you also want to have balance in terms of subject but like balance and difficulty is kind of hard because you need to have enough easy problems and this is just some general advice for anyone who's making a test for like anything uh you should probably make the test easier than you think this is just like uh like hmmt has this has had issues with this i think the February czars maybe like tried harder and made the forcibly made the test easier and maybe we did sort of okay on this. I think November had more mm -hmm. issues, especially near the beginning end. Like the beginning end of the test <clears throat> should really be like very easy because you want to have like you want the test to be a good experience for all of the contestants. And so like the people who are making the test are probably like some like, you know, oh, I've done all these, you know, I've, I've seen a bunch of stuff. Maybe these problems all feel kind of a little bit easy or something, but like, they're not actually easy in any absolute sense, even if they're easier than 
some other things, even if they're easier than the second half of the test, like you should still be careful. And, you know, you don't, you don't want the contestants to be sad. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another reason that how... Oh yeah, sorry. <clears throat> oh, another reason that it's hard to like have easy problems is because like, it's easy to write easy problem, to write problems that are easy in the sense of difficulty, but are like very sort of old hat and just sort of recycle old, re recycle the same old things. Uh, and so it's it's harder to sort of find ways to package, you know, new, to, to package things in a way that is like, very, that is still very, like, that's still very easy, at least in a relative sense, you know, uh, e easier certainly, but still feels like fresh. It's, it's, it's a difficult task. Yeah. So Hold in general, Oh yeah, I was going to say that like, regarding the easy problem, like make the problems like easier than you think. Um, I remember in high school, I ran like a contest for middle schoolers and it wasn't until like the third year of running the contest where I finally was able to write a test where the median score was 15 out of 30. So um, I think this is a testament <laughs> to like how difficult it was like the first year the median was like two out of 30 which was not very good the median uh, was two out of 30 that's, that's correct i mean i don't think H H I think at november the median on each of the individual rounds was like two out of ten on both out of ten. something like that might have been three maybe it was three but it might have been two like you know you know we should have had more easier problems at the beginning yeah but yeah, uh, so that's just some general ideas with like constructing, well, that's more of constructing good contests, but for constructing good problems, uh, in general, you don't, you really want to be careful about like what ideas you're like hash, like if you're drawing too much, like if it feels like a very, like if you do enough problems, you'll get an idea of what's, what's standard and what's not. And you really don't want your problems to be a kind of a one trick pony. Like you just throw it like a single thing at it and it just breaks or any, or, or it be like some old fat old idea that you've seen before um i mean of course it's good to draw inspiration from some other problems but you don't want to use like the same ideas um so that leads to like another topic of like how do you get inspiration on writing problems like we've talked a lot about like what to do with your ideas like you just write them down and then like you create like a good or bad problem with it and then like we talked about what goes into a good problem but uh, i think it's also worth discussing like like how how to like come up with ideas uh for like a good problem so i am also kind of a beginner i'm kind of a beginner problem writer at least compared to these two i've written like only a handful of problems total uh for hmt um and a lot of those like um I don't know. I would say the first couple of problems I wrote, wrote were like very kind of standard ideas, like kind of bashy, kind of weird combo. And uh, but um, one of my favorite things to base like the problems I write on are like flavor text. Uh, now, obviously, you do not want to go. This is like kind of a double edged sword. You do not want to go too ham with your flavor text. But uh, so like it can be like a pretty nice place to start when thinking of a problem and then you can either drop the flavor text later or like you know at least use that as a basis for the problem and then you could keep it or uh something like that like i think one of the problems that i wrote that i like um you know i was like thinking about like i think the different types of dice that you roll and then, like, that led to one of the problems that we had on HMT that was, like, you know, a, a four-sided dice, a six-sided dice, and, like, an eight-sided dice. Uh, so that's, like, one that comes off, off, the, off the top of my head. Another time was, like, I was desperately trying to write a problem that involved, like, seven rings. Uh, I That did not go anywhere, but, like, it was, like, a fun, like, exercise in attempting to, like, force generating functions into a problem, which does not... Wait, like, rings as in, like... Like 1870. It's in the rings. song? The yeah. song Seven. Yeah. The... Yeah. 
Except I wanted to do something like generating functions, like you do like some permutation or not some some subset of those like of the of the rings, and then you get some outcome. I don't even remember what the actual problem was. About. That was <laughs> that's the one that came off off. Of, that's like the first one that comes to mind when I was thinking of like a problem I wrote because of flavor text. Mm. But do mm. you guys have any thoughts on like where you got ideas from? I think I'm uh, kind of rambling. So I think sometimes I, it can be a combination of just like. I'm trying to think of problems I wrote for HMMT. Actually, I'm going to pull up a copy of the test real quick and just have a look-see through it. But like, it's some combination of like, if you are randomly thinking and you just like have some idea. Oh, actually, one funny I problem, one example of a successful attempt to write a problem about flavor tech, uh, to write a problem based on flavor text was like somehow- For, we for, some... for you series? Oh, I was not thinking of that one, but like we were playing the game, like the floor is lava. And I was like, oh, floor, like floor func functions. What if the, and then you take the floor of it, equals lava. And so like, I just made some like stupid, like easy combinatorics poll. Like, you know, you take these variables, T, H, E, L, A, V, whatever, in like the set zero, one half and one. What's the probability that the floor of T times H times E equals L <laughs> times so A times cute. E times A? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and apparently it was usable on the test. Yeah. Wait, yeah. That was such a Sometime, cute And then, you know, other times it's just like, you maybe are just like randomly thinking about some facts and uh, you generate some idea based off of it. Like, uh, I think I have actually generated some ideas this way just by like randomly be thinking about numbers a lot. Like somehow one time, like, on the way to like go rock climbing or even like at the rock climbing gym, I was like randomly thinking about numbers. And somehow I like, one of the things I was thinking about was somehow like- This is the most Luke thing I've ever heard. <laughs> one third is three tenths plus one over 30 or something. Hmm. What if we think about this as like one third minus one thirtieth is three tenths. This is like, somehow I convinced myself that this is like some identity involving like one over X plus X cubed and like some <laughs> corresponding thing with one over X. And like, I was, I thought some more and generated some poem about a polynomial and then like played around with it some more. And eventually this like became a problem that made it onto the HMMT team round about like find all polynomials such that one over P of X plus one over P of one over X equals X plus one over X or some. And did this even use the original well, fact? About one third plus no, whatever reason. I had originally, it had originally been some version of like one over P of X minus one over P of one over X equals like one over X minus some, some version with minus signs instead, but then I realized it could be made nicer. Uh, so yeah, like sometimes just thinking about that or sometimes you just like can make a setup. I think I wrote more geometry more than other stuff, but sometimes you just like, I don't know. You think of an equation you want to make a thing about, or I don't know. You can also just yeah. like, you know, I don't know. Go, go, yeah, I, I think I've yet to write like a conventional geo problem. <laughs> conventional? Like, well, what I, I guess conventional are... mean? 2D. <laughs> or like, I don't know. I think there are like, sometimes you have this type of problem that's like, you have a triangle and you like give it side lengths and then you could just like, you draw some other stuff and it's just like, well, you could just coordinate back. You could just do the whole thing with Cartesian coordinates. That's like, do you really want to just do the whole thing with Cartesian coordinates? So like, yes. you know, if you just give people a triangle and its side lengths, that's like a little bit bland, you know, uh, maybe like there can be. There are definitely things. some cool problems you could come from that. Yeah, so there are some like... cool things, but like, I mean, it can also be nice to branch away from that and do like more fun things where you like give other stuff. Like, you know, I was thinking about a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle and it's just like, oh, you can get some, you get some nice ratio, even just some like known, some facts that I considered. Well, I don't know. I had some facts that I had seen before at least about like some ra ratio of areas equals some ratio of things or whatever. And I like came up with something that was like, oh, if you have a quadrilateral AX, BY and you, and you intersect the diagonals at C and then you're like, AX times AY, BX times BY, CX times CY, and then you can like do stuff from there. I'm being, maybe I'm being too, I feel like I'm 
trying to do too much math out loud. Maybe it's maybe I should not be doing too much math out loud <laughs> when I could be like, I think math is usually better presented on paper or something. <laughs> Hold it. What are your thoughts on but, like, like how you get ideas? How I get inspiration? Yeah, I guess I was going to say like three things. So the first one is like, um, sometimes I like to pull ideas from higher mathematics um, and like drop them down into the Olympiad world. So uh, one good example of this is like, um, I forget the year and problem number, but it's like P minus Q and PQ minus Q are both squares. Like, and you want to say about 2022 number four? Yeah, That's so true. that one. Yeah. So that was like motivated by some algebraic number theory. Um, another one is like, I was thinking about Kaylee Bacharach and how because we this, are, is some think, this is some theorem in geometry about like cubic curves that intersect at nine points look it up so it's i was cool. i was thinking about some generalization of this to like a uh, cortex and then i created um some tstst number one i don't remember which one but like it was something about it was something that just looks if you don't know that it comes from higher math you wouldn't know it was just some standard looking geometry about like a yeah it was it was, it was a very standard looking problem. problem and you could solve it using standard methods but the genesis is by looking at Kaylee Bacharach and the last example of this is um, the very infamous problem uh, about covering a square with rectangles um, and this was motivated by observing the fact that like this is last year this was a problem on last year's TSTST about like. Uh, it's like you have some points in a square and you want to like draw some rectangles so that like the rectangles cover the entire square except for the points themselves. Yeah, this is uh, you, it's a notorious problem look, for it's, other it's, reasons, but <laughs> it's worth looking up. It's TSTST 2022 number one, but it's notorious for its difficulty, but it's also just a pretty nice problem. <laughs> This is what happens when you put a, a P3 in a P1 <laughs> position. <laughs> okay, well, this this was like, uh, I came up with this because in topology class, we were talking about like bases for like topological spaces, like product topological spaces. Um, and the example used was like, open rectangles are a basis for R squared. And I was like, hmm, this seems very interesting. How many open rectangles do we need to cover certain open subsets of R squared? And that's how I came up with the problem. <laughs> um, okay, well, what else was I going to say? Another one was, um, sometimes I just go to like random math talks or um, see random diagrams and I get inspired. So uh, maybe I should not say too much, but like sometimes I see diagrams that like appear in talks and I get inspired even though it's not really related to the talk at all. But like I was thinking about some setup that was similar. Um, the last thing I was going to say is, at least for computational contests, I like to write problems in such a way that, yes, there is a nice way to solve the problem, but it should also be, like, brute forceable if you have enough time. Um, I do this at because I... Early. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, like, at least on the early end, maybe. Yeah. Well, go on. Let's... Um, so, like, I write for a contest in Illinois called yeah. the North Suburban Math League, um, as you might know. And um, it's a five problem, 30 minute contest. And because the constraints of five problems is like so little, you don't want to like make every single problem be of the type like, oh, you must find the key idea or else you will just sit there and do nothing. I really want to give students like something to work on, even if they don't know the, the smart idea or the way that like reduces computation. So at least I try to write the problems in such a way that like students are not just sitting there. Um, at least they can bash the problems if they have enough time. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Evan Chen has said something about like, ideally the first like one third of the problems on a contest should be like every contestant feels like they could have gotten them, even if maybe they actually don't because they like miss, because they like did some arithmetic wrong or something. Uh, but yeah. Also, like one other source for inspiration for problems, and just like a really good way to write problems, and just like a really fun thing to do in general, is like you can get inspiration from other people, and you can co-author problems with other people. You'll a lot of my author credits on HMMT were with other people. We even mm -hmm. had one particularly fun session late at night where we had a problem that had five authors because we were just like this is the infamous 
it's this was algebra number theory number three. I recommend you go look at HMT's website and like ah. see this. The, the the solution, the official solutions actually like include a record of like how this poem was written and the different contributions each of the five authors made. I think this is well worth a read. This was an excellent <laughs> problem. <laughs> but yeah, I, I actually agree with this because sometimes um one of my uh, like it's really fun to like bounce ideas for problems off off of like the people around you and like you know because a lot of the problems that people write are kind of shaped by their own experiences through math contests and like you know if you share that with other uh, if you shared that with other people you get all sorts of different perspectives and like ways to like look at look at or cre like shape or create like or expand on like problems so yeah that's really yeah, so people yeah. People get. Their I actually own have not intuitions. read this thing, so I I will do that after oh. this recording. <laughs> people get their own intuitions about like how. People get their own intuitions about like how math works, and other people will have can have different intuitions from yours, and somehow just like doing. I mean, just generally doing math with other people is fun, but like this can also <laughs> shape problems you write with other people, and it can be a good time. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I. Guess we sense. went on for a long time. Quite a while, we yeah. have been going for like half an hour or something. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe we should wrap up. Yeah. But yeah. Well, uh, that was that was all I thought. Actually, uh, thank you guys for more than just like your insights on uh, uh, more than just having this wonderful conversation, uh, but also because I kind of need this so I can think about how to make next year's HOT November contest exciting. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. Uh, so mm-hmm. Uh, so to our uh, to our wonderful viewers, hope you're uh, enjoying the remainder of your school year, uh, if that still exists. And we will catch you next time. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. I am here today because I wanted to dedicate today's episode to my grandfather. Um, he was an avid fan of the series ever since it first came out, and he watched every single episode. Uh, pretty much like he had notifications on and he watched it as soon as they came on and he liked every episode and while he didn't really understand English too well um, he loved just listening to us while doing other things uh, he loved to uh, listen to me talk he loved to listen to Luke and Holden talk and he knew all three of us by name and um, yeah so he loved he really loved the Curious Cube um, a few weeks ago he passed away after a heroic three-year battle with cancer um, at the age of 68. Uh, when I went home to see him, one of the first things I asked him was uh, whether he watched the last episode, the Putnam one. And he said he had. Uh, he watched it on the little hospital TV uh, and he really liked it. And that was really nice to hear. And he told me that um, I want to say, what, 48 hours before he passed? Something like that? Yeah. Um, so it's hard to know that this is the first episode that he will not be able to see. But that's kind of why I wanted to de dedicate it to him. So, yeah, if you're watching this, thank you for sticking to it through, through my spiel. But uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for watching. And I'll catch you next time.